Okay, welcome tonight. Um, we are here to talk about the draft, and I'm gonna say draft over and over again, reopening plan for USD 490, kind of what we're thinking and where that came from and um, kind of where we're headed and give you the latest breaking news that we have so far tonight. Um, before we get started, I do wanna take a minute to introduce everybody as they're in the order that you're gonna kind of see them as we work through the PowerPoint tonight. Um, Carla King, EMS principal. James Scott is our transportation director. Um, Chandra Spears is the director of nutritional services. I think I called her food service guru in our staff one, but it all works. Um, Jalinda Keeling is our ENEA president and an EHS math teacher extraordinaire. Deanna Corky is an EMS math teacher extraordinaire. Um, Bruce Lawling is our EHS principal. Susan Holthouse is our Grandview principal. And last but not least, Kathy Robertson is our Director of Business Services and Support Services, and I probably messed that up because it's really long. Um, but she will be monitoring our chat tonight and our Q&A so that we kind of capture any thoughts you have and any ideas you have because that's really the whole intent behind tonight. So before we get started, let me um, share my screen so you can see the PowerPoint that we're going to, or the Google slide that we're going to be working from. All righty, you're going to see draft on this multiple times over and over again because it really truly is a draft. Um, as you know, or may have known, uh, we've been working on this for uh, quite a, well about a week and a half now probably. But um, throughout the PowerPoint, we learned this with the um, staff group that we did earlier today at three o'clock. We have created a bitly which just is a short link to a Google form that will take you to a place where you can put in questions, comments, and kudos. You know, when I was growing up on the farm, mom would always say, what do you say? So we have a spot in there for you. If you want to say thank you to the team that's been working on this, you absolutely can do that. Um, all you have to put in, you can put in the HTTPS, but you can also just put in bit.ly forward slash 490 capital R reopening capital T for team. Um, it is uh, specific on the capital R and the capital T, so you will have to put that piece in there. We've also added that to the top of almost every slide that's in the slide deck, so um, feel free to at any time, if you have a phone or a device or you wanna add something later. Um, some of the questions, may, Kathy will be moving into there so that we capture everything so that the team can talk about that tomorrow. So um, bit.ly forward slash 490 reopening team. For questions, comments, and there it is right at the top. It'll be at the top for almost, and it is really almost every slide out there. Uh, we hope to be done in about an hour, but we'll take questions for a little while after that if that's um, an interest and people are interested in staying around. Okay, as you know, this timeline went out last, about a week and a half ago, when I think on the 10th or so, the 13th, and it talked about what our plan was as we move forward to put together our draft reopening timeline. We tonight are right there at the 21st. So we're holding our parent and staff Zoom meetings. And our intent tonight is really to get feedback from, we got feedback from staff earlier today. We're interested in getting feedback from parents as well in our community. Um, last week, so I think the 13th, the, the surveys closed on the 18th. Um, I pulled a couple questions from there. We had about 1,138 people who filled that survey out. We appreciate that. Um, as we designed our plan, when the team met yesterday, we really talked about safety first. How do we provide a safe learning environment for our students? That really is our goal. Um, and your feedback tonight is gonna give us things we may not have thought about, other things we need to consider. So you'll notice in our survey, at the top up there is parents' responses roughly 25% of 27% of them um, were comfortable sending their kids back to school and about 25% of staff were comfortable coming back to school. Others want to know some what that guidance is, kind of the safety precautions we're putting in place. And so those are the things we're going to go through tonight. Okay, you see that bit.ly up there if you have any ideas. There's two sections to this. There's an instructional side and there's a um, operation side. And we're going to talk a little bit first about the instructional side and what classrooms will look like, um, how we're gonna respond to things that happen from our direction from our county health department. Um, and that's our first section we're gonna kind of dive into. 
So the first part is really understanding current reality. The, this information came directly from the Kansas State Department of Education and the Kansas Health Department. So as we move forward into the school year, one of the things that they will be talking to us about is are we under low restrictions, moderate restrictions, or high restrictions? Um, low restrictions, obviously, the, there's low case numbers, um, things are on the decline. At that point, we're able to utilize on-site learning, in-person learning. Moderate restrictions, we might have a higher case load. Um, onset date could be, should be flat. Um, at that point, they may ask us to do hybrid learning. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. High restrictions means our cases are elevated. Um, hospitals may be at peak per ICU usage. And so they would ask us to potentially go into remote learning. So we basically have low restrictions, moderate restrictions, high restrictions. And that determines kind of helps us identify which learning environment um, we may be in at the time. Let's go into what the learning environments are. The three learning environments are on-site, hybrid, and remote. On-site is pretty much what it says. Um, when the, we have low restrictions for COVID, schools can operate at 100% capacity, um, group sizes and spectator events can meet lo with local guidelines. On the opposite end of that is the remote learning where the numbers are high, we're at high risk or high restrictions, and um, we have to have smaller group sizes. We may be able to have um, some students in maybe with special learning needs, um, but for the most part, all of our learning at that point would be remote. Those are kind of the two ends of the continuum. In the center is the hybrid piece where they're gonna maybe ask us to reduce our building capacity by 50% or 25%. Um, that social distancing would be enforced at those points. So the smaller numbers in the building would allow for us to social distance more. Um, that's the hybrid model. We then took that information and talked about what does that mean for us in USD 490? Because we have to decide kind of how do we deliver that, that learning. So obviously on-site, it's a regular week, Monday through Friday, five days of in-person learning. All students would be coming to school. The opposite end of that is remote. Um, again, that's the learning at home um, on our remote devices. There wouldn't be anything in person, potentially in maybe small groups of five, 10 kids maybe, um, but all students would be put on remote at that point. The other side of that is the hybrid piece. And so this is what um, the team, we have a team of called the reopening team. Um, it's about 45-ish people that kind of sat down yesterday and we spent all day kind of hashing through these things and trying to figure out what that looks like for us. Um, the hybrid model is a modified week. So again, in a hybrid situation, the health department may say our numbers are elevated and we need to lower the number of people that are in the, kids that are in the building. So this is what we're proposing for our hybrid model. There would be four groups of students divided by last name. Yes, if um, there could be some situations where there might be a, a foster child in the household with a different last name and we would make accommodations for those things. But for the most part, they'd be divided into groups A, B, C, and D. So hybrid option number one, and this would reduce our group to about 50% of them on Monday and Wednesday and 50% of them on Tuesday and Thursday. So on the first two days, Monday and Wednesday, group A and B would meet in person while group C and D meet remotely. Tuesday, Thursday, you flip-flop that. Group C and D meet in person, groups A and B meet remote for remote learning. And on Friday would be remote learning for all. The hybrid option two would allow us to, so hybrid one is a 50%, hybrid two would allow us to go to 25%. So we basically have one group per day and then that Friday would still be remote for all. Now, that's at a building level or a district level with input from the health department. But let's say that I'm a parent and I want my child to do remote learning only at home. You can make that choice. That is perfectly okay. And our goal as a district is to provide you those choices and to provide you that support. So we'll be working with teachers. It will not look the same as continuous learning looked in the spring. That was, um, our teachers did a, the very best job. In fact, I think they did a pretty awesome job 
of implementing something kind of on the fly that we were building kind of as we went. This is going to look different than that and it's going to be set up different than that. So remote learning won't necessarily look like continuous learning. So you got to kind of tuck that one away and, and head to what our new remote learning um, will look like. We are looking at a continuous format, a platform that everybody would use, that kids would be familiar with, that would be engaging for kids. Um, so there's some pieces in there that are still to come, but um, it will just look different. As a parent, I could potentially choose a hybrid working with um, my building. If I want to send them two days a week and have them home for three days a week for remote learning, we can, we can do that. We'll just have to figure out kind of all the details of that, but our goal is to provide options for families that support your needs and your comfort level with coming back to school. I will tell you that right now, I'm a little wildcat to come flying in here, um, we really are working on on-site learning. That's where we're gonna start because that's where we think we are right now, but parents still, that's where we would be as a district, parents still have a choice of remote if that's an option that they would like to take. So those will continue to be there as we move forward. So that's a little bit of what instruction looks like. And I know that's kind of a lot to wrap our head around because school never really looked like that when I was in school. Um, with that in mind, that's only half of the puzzle. The second part of that puzzle is operations. What are we gonna put in place to look at um, the safety side on the operation side of our organization? So we had six teams that met looking at these different areas. We had a health team, a classrooms team, a common spaces and transitions team, an extra or co-curricular team, facilities and transportation work together, and our food service folks work together. And we're gonna now walk you through kind of some of the um, decisions that were made as part of that piece. And I believe I am turning the floor over to Carla. Again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or stick them in that bit.ly slash 490 reopening team. Okay, Carla. I'm unmuted. Thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate your time and um, hope that we can answer some questions that um, you have had as parents as we go through this process. Um, a big piece of this document is looking at facilities and our procedures for how to implement safe, safety precautions throughout our building. Um, when looking at our cleaning of the building, um, the district contracts with PureZone, that is a company that we've had for a couple of years, they already have systems in place with checklists and for detailed cleaning and there are additional protocols that we'll be using to help um, with additional cleaning throughout this process. Every single day we will have deep sanitation in every area of our building. Um, in addition, we'll have be working with our health department in order to make sure that we're following safeguards that they have um, implemented for us as well. And then looking at our um, custodial staff. Some of our buildings only have one full-time custodian during the day. We will be making alterations to schedules in order to accommodate the need um, for additional staff um, during the school day. Our head custodians will continue to take the lead as our district um, communication piece. In our main offices, our health rooms, also our libraries, we will be installing um, temporary face shields or um, sneeze guards is what they, they, they call those, um, just for another order of um, personal protection. Hand sanitizers will be available in every single classroom in addition to all of the learning areas in the, the buildings, for example, at the middle school, we call those pods. Um, elementary, I think they call them learning, learning um, centers. Those two will have portable sanitation stations for kids to be able and staff to be able to wash um, hands if, if, the, if the regular sink is not available. We will be implementing um, hand washing every hour. Um, our elementary buildings, some of our pre-K and kindergarten, I think, do have sinks in the classroom, so they will be able to utilize that um, with ease and less transition for kids. But we will be doing lots of hand washing. Um, social distancing, that is something that we will follow. And um, we will have signage throughout our buildings. We'll be kindergarten or pre-K through fifth, eighth grade buildings all um, utilize CHAMPS, which is a framework 
for providing structures throughout our buildings. And um, we do that routines, we talk about voice levels. This will just be another piece that we'll be talking about. For example, all students will walk in the same direction. We'll teach them about um, six feet and social distancing. So again, those social distancing, distancing pieces will be in play. We are so fortunate as a district to have new facilities. Um, because of that, our airflow system has already equipped with being able to have um, ex external air coming through the building. So that's a big piece for some, for some districts. Um, in addition, we do have filters, a filtration system through our air conditioning and heating systems. Those filters will be changed regularly um, and as required. All of our trash reciprocals will be no touch. So there'll be no having to lift up a lid and, and dispose of trash or anything um, to that degree. Also, all of that um, equipment will be sprayed down each and every night. If you do access, the, if students are accessing the building and need any of the ADA accessible um, means, for example, opening a door, all of those Devices will be cleaned at least two to three times a day or after usage, in addition to elevators. We will be practicing um, all of our emergency drills, tornado drills, fire drills, emergency act, um, evacuations. With that, we will be wearing masks when we are practicing those. In the event of a real emergency, again, we will have um, masks with those. Something a little different for us in school is water fountains. Um, we will not be um, offering those for use. Um, however, we will be um, installing some um, temporary um, water systems that we're gonna talk about in a little bit um, that are, that are um, touchless so you can um, use a water bottle. All students and staff will have to have their own water bottle. That's something we'll ask parents to provide um, when your kids come to school is their own water bottle. We will not be using a shared fountain. Um, those systems that they have are touchless, so you can just refill your water bottle and not um, have to worry about contamination of someone else's water. Lockers, this is going to be a little bit different for our middle school and high school um, teachers and students. The academic lockers will not be assigned to students. Instead, all students will have their own backpack. They will keep that backpack with them throughout the day. Um, the reason for this is it really eliminates another piece of um, cleaning. If we utilize the lockers each night, every locker would have to be opened and sanitized. Also, in the event that the health department would say, okay, we need to now go into a more restrictive level, um, students would already have all of their supplies that they would need. Um, in, in March, when we were told, oh, we're not coming back after spring break, as a school, that was a huge piece for us. How are we gonna get medication back to kids? How are we going to get um, their iPads to them, their backpacks? You know, maybe they left a novel here. So that will just help us streamline this fluid process that we're going to have. Um, academic lockers, again, we will not be utilizing those. However, athletic lockers, we will be using, we will, assign those lockers. One person will use a locker and we will also social distance the lockers. Um, and so those lockers each night will be sanitized. Playground equipment for those elementary folks, that's huge. It's kind of, it's difficult for us to think about keeping kids distanced and um, let alone not allowing them to utilize the playground equipment. That's really difficult for all of us. And um, we are working with our local health department to determine how we can utilize that in a safe means. As of right now, they are closed and unavailable. But again, as a district, we're really working with the health department to kind of give us some guidance on how we could have cleaning protocols in place so we could um, have that equipment available to students if it's safe. Students will be washing hands prior to going to recess and also returning from recess before um, going to the classroom. If anyone has requested use of our facilities throughout the school year, that may be rescheduled. Um, all of that will depend on where we, at, where we are at as far as um, availability in the building, 
and also our custodial staff. In order for us to um, rent out our facilities or use, have another agency use our facilities, and we have to make sure that we can keep our students safe as well as the people that are utilizing our facilities. So we have to make sure we have um, the appropriate custodial staff to be able to clean and to do that. So um, that process will still be the same. You'll still utilize the, the form through the district website and make those requests. Um, if, if things change, that communication will be to those people who have um, filled out that information. Our mail is another thing. We will have lots of mail coming into school, as we always do. We do utilize the bus barn as our central location. From there, one person then delivers that mail to the buildings, um, also any other supplies that may be needed. Any other vendors that would maybe come directly to the school, um, that that's um, product or if it's a, it's a person, we would meet them outside the door and, and get that. So we will not have visit those, those vendors inside the building. And if we have a, a, a mechanic that maybe needs to come work on an elevator or something, um, they will be following the safety protocols set by the health department, also being required to wear the mask. And um, we'll try to coordinate services so those are done outside of contact with students just to limit um, exposure. Um, James Scott is up next. He's our Director of Transportation, and he's going to talk about transportation. All right. Um, I think to start with, of course, the sanitation. Uh, we'd be wiping down and spraying the buses with a disinfectant after each route. So every time we change students, we would clean those buses. Uh, students will be ch temperature checked and hand si sanitizer prior to getting on the bus. Um, once they get on, we would have an assigned seat uh, provided for all the students. Uh, that way we can load and unload the bus properly according to their route. Um, that way we'd load at the back of the bus to start out the route and finish up at the front of the bus. And then when we get to the school, we could do the opposite. We could start at the front of the bus unloading and work our way to the back. That way they're not cross, crossing paths and stuff. Uh, we would definitely promote social, social distancing at the uh, bus stops. Um, kind of a, a guideline would be about uh, one and a half of those squares in the sidewalk is gonna be your six feet. So the kids kind of have an idea. We'd be putting literature like that out and information available help them understand the social distancing at the bus stop. Uh, drivers would follow all health protocols and safety measures. Um, they would run a daily log of the students so we know everybody that rode the bus that day, uh, clean and sanitize after every route or trip. Um, when weather permitted, they'd have their windows open to uh, have that fresh air flow and uh, help out with that. Uh, in order to lower the capacity on our buses, uh, we would adjust our start and stop times for uh, 6th to 12th grade from 7.45 start time to 2.45 stop time. And uh, pre-K to 5th grade, we would do an 8.30 start time and a 3.45 stop time. Uh, this would help us to separate those groups so there wasn't cross-contamination. Uh, we'll be hauling high schoolers on a high school bus, middle schoolers on a middle school bus, and grade schools on their appropriate grade school bus. Um, and we can really get those numbers down to about one per seat um, when we were in, in full session and have all students going. And then, of course, would readjust seat assignments as we went to 50% or 20% capacity to get more and more social distancing in between them. Um, activities and athletics, uh, we would minimize those to, uh, you know, necessary players. Um, to try to keep them down as low as possible and, and promote social distance as much as we could on the bus when transporting them. Um, they would be cleaned in between every trip. Uh, same things with our cars and vans. Uh, we would clean in between every trip. Um, so even if we're using a van or a car to uh, transport kids that would be cleaned and disinfected in between all the trips. And uh, 
I think that about covers it for transportation. I think uh, Chandra with food service is up next. Chandra, before you jump in, just so parents realize that one of the things we are proposing is that a potential change in start and stop times um, for both the high school, middle school, and the elementary so that we can go get the high school and middle school kids, deliver them on the bus, clean and sanitize the bus, and go get the little, the, the little ones, the pre-K through fifth. Um, so there's a intention behind that so that we're able to, and then the same thing in the afternoon, we would pick up and deliver those kids, sanitize buses, and then go get the elementary students. So that's one of the big proposed changes. Lisa, um, do you wanna just speak to maybe a couple questions that are coming up that have that same thread as sure. in how, how are parents able to tell you what model are they going to have a selection? Are we just going to weave our way in and out of these three different models? How does that work? Because there's quite a few questions regarding that. So there'll be a couple of different things at play. There'll be if the health department moves us into one of those different models and requires it, that would be one option. If parents are going to choose um, the remote or hybrid option, once we take all of this, the final plan, which we'll work on tomorrow, once we take that to the board for approval, then we'll start working with parents. Um, the schools will be reaching out and we'll work on how to sign you up for which option you kind of, if you want to choose remote, how will that work? There was a question about um, what devices. We're, we're a one-to-one -one district. So those same devices would be checked out to you again. And um, we should be able to do everything through Google and online and, and the apps that we currently have. So there shouldn't be any special pieces that anybody would need. Internet when access to the device. Do you want to talk about temperature checks, maybe? Um, temperature checks. Right now, we have um, staff that will have the no-touch no thermometers, and we are training staff on how to do that. Um, so that we will be staff will be taking care of that piece. Our our district nurse is training everybody on that needs to use them on how to use them. Thank We're you. also looking at some other ways to kind of capture that potentially. Thank you. All right, Chandra, you ready to talk about food service? Thanks, Teresa. Um, just to touch base on food service a little bit, there's gonna be a few changes this year. Um, obviously, the number of students in any location will kind of help determine some of the direction that we're gonna take with it. One thing that's really important that we do want all parents to understand is that regardless of the uh, type of education you're doing or we move to, whether it's in-person or hybrid or remote, we do have systems in place for feeding. So whether that is we get moved to a remote situation or you've chosen for your child to do remote learning, you will be able to reserve meals to pick them up. Um, this is not gonna change or be interrupted. So we do wanna make sure parents understand that we do have a system in place for that. Um, as far as ordering meals, um, at the elementary level, we were probably going to look at ordering our lunch and our breakfast for the following day, just so that we can kind of have an idea of where we're headed. So we're looking at ways to do some different, um, some different methods to do reservations for that type of meal. And also so that we can charge these students and we can remove the use of individual lunch cards that we've previously used in at the elementary level. Um, those obviously have a lot of touch points, so we'd like to remove those if at all possible. So we're looking into some different methods for that. And then, sorry. Can you switch my screen? I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, as far as the, the choice selection that you'll see this, uh, this year, we have made some adjustments to it according to some uh, federal guidelines uh, that we've been given. We're going to be doing a three choice for lunch. That'll be a hot choice, a cold choice, and an entree salad at this point. It will all be in disposable packaging. Everything from the condiments will be individually packaged and the silverware will be uh, wrapped, disposable silverware. For lunches, they'll have two breakfast choices. One will be a cereal breakfast and the other one will be a hot, a hot breakfast of some sort. For elementary classes, it's likely that we may be transporting uh, breakfasts definitely to the classroom, possibly lunch. This just seems a little bit more feasible 
in terms of distancing and um, and sanitation. However, we're looking at a variety of options, so that's uh, that could change possibly. As far as the food service staff is concerned, we are taking several safety precautions for both students and faculty. We will maintain social distancing, um, both in the kitchen when we're preparing food, and for the students, should they be coming into the kitchen to pick up their meals, um, we will have markers on the ground to kind of indicate where uh, students can keep safe distances while they're picking up lunches. We will not be having any bars um, or self-serve items. Faculty will be serving the meals. They will just get them with the minimal amount of touch points and then leave the, the service area as soon as possible. We will be doing touchless point of sale. As I mentioned, for the elementaries, we will not be using cards this year. And for the middle school and high school, they will just need to bring their photo ID or a picture of their ID on their phone and we can scan it and they won't have to use the touchpad at all. The food service staff will be wearing personal protective equipment and we will have enhanced sanitizing routines for all points in the kitchen. We also encourage parents to make online payments for meals if at all possible. We would like to have as minimal amount of cash flow changing hands as possible. Uh, we will also be having students wash hands prior to eating. Um, the eating area will be sanitized before each meal in between groups, and we'll have assigned seating for contact tracing if needed. Uh, one of the one of the really important things for parents, uh, we want to keep in communication with you uh, because we have transition now from summer. Some people have participated in a summer feeding program that offers the meal service for ages 0 to 18. As we go into the new year, we will be going back to our regular meals and that will apply to the students in the school system. The uh, Also of note, Parents that may have not previously qualified for free and reduced lunches are encouraged to go ahead and fill out that application. Um, lots of people's circumstances and situations have changed over the past few months. And if you previously had been denied that benefit, you may in fact qualify for it now. So we're encouraging parents to go ahead and fill that out. Um, so just know that if you, if you are approved for free lunches or reduced lunches, that's what you'll have. If you are a full pay, you will have that as well. So that's how we'll be going forward when we start school. And in the event of exposure, district guidelines will be followed, but food distribution will be continued throughout the year. Thanks. Okay, Shannon, I have a couple questions for that are specific to food service. Okay. Students can still bring their own meals. I don't think that's a problem. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, we can buy milk with cash or use our account. Sure. Yeah. And um, as of right now, we're not starting with any extra snack items or vending machines. I'm not sure on the answer on that one. I didn't, I don't have an answer just yet on the vending machines. Um, at the high school level, we are looking at the options for offering a la carte items, but we don't have that just yet. As soon as I have that information that we will make that available. Okay, that's a good question. All right, we are moving on. It's time to now talk. So we've gotten to the building and we've um, had some lunch and now it's time to talk about classrooms and classrooms. So we're turning over to Jalinda and Deanna. So um, what we did is we looked at the um, State Department's operations manual and we kind of just went through it and looked at how can that, once we have kids in our classroom, what does that look like? Um, the personal hygiene, we're going to be teaching, modeling, practicing that, you know, hand washing, how to appropriately wear your mask, things like that. Um, it will be no different than how we teach our, our, you know, rules and protocols in our classroom will just be an additional piece. And like Mrs. King mentioned earlier, the pre-K too, um, they have their sink, so they're going to be able to do that hand washing really simply um, in their classroom. Um, as far as um, those who don't have sinks, um, the practice of anytime you enter or leave a room, you are hand sanitizing. Um, the trauma-enforced practices, um, just talking about how 
just a pandemic in general affects everyone and that we're all in this together, those kinds of, of um, practices with kids. The fabric and soft surfaces are harder to clean than soft, than uh, the hard surfaces. So they, we're having those discussions on what can and can't um, be in the classroom and maybe removing some of those items that will add space so that we can space kids out better. Um, whether it's in those common spaces where they have the little cushions or even if it's alternative seating in a classroom, those kinds of things, just working with how that works. Um, we're gonna have seating charts to ensure that we know what kid sat in what desk to help with that contact tracing and make sure that all kids are facing in the same direction, much like on the buses. We're gonna make sure kids are comfortable using whatever technology it is, whether it's their MacBooks at the high school or iPads in the other levels. Um, I think all of our kids did a great job working with that technology in the spring. Um, but like we said, it will be different. It will be um, better and more concise and thought out, but just ensuring that those kids know that, you know, if you are exposed and you have to go into that remote learning session, they're able to easily transition from being in the classroom to a remote session with the technology. We will still have attendance policies, even if you're remote learning or you're um, hybrid and you're part-time in the classroom, part-time remote, we're still gonna be doing attendance every day. Um, Deanna's gonna talk a little bit about that in a second, but um, we will build, still be enforcing all of that truancy and all of those things. And we're gonna do the best we can to keep kids in the stable groups, which is why we are talking about those ABCD groups um, and to avoid mixing. Um, the kids will still get their specials. They'll still be able to get their art and music and those things. Um, they may just happen in their classroom instead of physically moving to the music room um, with the exception of possibly PE because they do need to be able to run around. But again, those are conversations we're having with our with our staff. So Deanna. All right, and I'm here basically to talk to you about two things. Field trips, um, I know that's a big thing for school age children to be able to go to the Salt Museum in, in Hutchinson and things like that. But we're really gonna have to look at some virtual field trips possibly because transportation. It's a transportation issue. It's already gonna be a challenge. So we're really gonna try to limit the amount of field trips. Remote learning, um, that's gonna be different than the spring. And I, I wanna say it's not even remotely the same. Um, the remote learning is going to provide students a way of being able to learn exactly what I would be teaching in the classroom, but from home. And it'll be on a daily basis. So it's not gonna be something where I post something for the week and they can do one thing for the whole week. Um, you'll notice in this slide that there's a remote learning daily log. Notice it says daily, and this is a sample. I don't know if ours will look exactly like this or if it will we'll tweak it a little bit, but there's a couple things that you probably can't see if you're looking on your phone, um, but down about the fourth line, it says the name of the teacher who made contact today. So you'll be listing the name of the teacher that contacted you today, that day. Um, hopefully it'll be the same teacher that'll be con contacting you throughout the whole process, but it may not be their math teacher or their classroom teacher. Um, it may be um, somebody else in the building that's a support staff, but there will be a person, a teacher that'll be contacting them on a daily basis. They will list their classes and their activities on that daily log. Um, did they complete the assignment or not? Did they take a test or not? And then their total number of minutes that they spent doing those activities. At the bottom, there's a place for a student signature and then a parent signature. We would not be able to do something on um, a Google form or something electronic for that reason of that signature. Now we may look into some things later on, but right now it's gonna have to be a form that is filled out by the parent and the child of what they did each day. Um, and I know that's gonna be a little bit different. I know the teachers are working very, very hard to be more prepared for the remote. I will guarantee that there's 
the majority of the teachers spent a lot of time this summer working on looking at different ways to provide a remote learning that's very um, intense, but yet relieve some of that stress off the parents so that the parents don't feel like they're teaching their children. They're just providing support instead of the actual teaching piece. And I will turn it over to Bruce Lawling, who will talk some more about some of those common spaces. All right, sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, first off, I, I would like to thank all of the all of the parents out there who have been very supportive in all of the efforts that we've done so far um, with, with all of the things that we had to do here at the high school in, in making arrangements for for uh, alternate graduation plans and, and ultimately canceling our traditional graduation. Um, I, I genuinely appreciate all of the support and, and recognition for, for the difficult decisions that we've, that we've had to make so far. Um, and, and as we continue to move forward, making some of those very difficult decisions, um, we, I genuinely appreciate how understanding um, a majority of parents have been um, with recognizing that these are not easy decisions and we know that uh, there are no great answers and, and we're, doing, um, we're doing the best for our students um, and for our staff. And so as we move forward, uh, we appreciate your continued support in that. Um, as we look at our common spaces, uh, we're going to try to, we're going to have to limit the amount of time and the amount of common spaces that we use. Um, obviously, those are, the, those are the places that become um, potential cross-contamination places. Uh, they create significant challenges for those uh, stable groupings that, uh, that Jolinda was referencing. And uh, so those common spaces are going to be, the, the, the use of those spaces are going to be limited tremendously from what they've, that they've been used in the past. Um, on that same line, even within the classrooms, uh, shared objects um, in lab stations, um, in and this is this is a huge issue at our at the high school with labs and things such as that, and, and with the middle school and 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 any of those commonly shared situations, we're going to have to limit um, to as little as possible uh, any shared objects. Uh, those things, so look, look, be on the lookout for. Um, for lists of some additional things that you may not have had to purchase or think about purchasing uh, in the past that may that may be new on a list for uh, some upper level students. The uh, extended learning areas in the hallways, uh, we need to limit the, the amount of uh, time that students spend in those in those uh, areas uh, simply again because of cross contamination and that's our biggest thing is trying to maintain for that contract tra tracing. Uh, I've seen lots of questions pop up in the chat and in the question and answer about what happens if a student becomes sick, what happens if a staff member becomes sick, and, and that's where that contract tracing uh, becomes super important. Um, as, as we learned here at the high school uh, in the last month, it's very important for us to know who has had contact with whom um, in order for us to make sure that we have, we've got the situation contained. Um, and so that, that uh, <laughs> We're going to be exploring a variety of different ways that we'll be looking at what those what those different look, groups look like and how those common spaces are going to be affected. Um, some of those common spaces uh, are going to be hallways, restrooms, uh, commons, and uh, we will be looking at ways to create guides for those hallway areas um, um, to control traffic flow, creating one way one way guides for hallways. Um, we're going to have to limit the number of visitors. Um, and we're going to contain visitors to that front office space. Um, and it's, and when, when, uh, with very few exceptions, schedule appointments are going to be required. Um, it's going to be much more difficult to just drop in uh, and, and visit. So um, when we, when a lot of questions have been, who, you know, how are we going to check these kids in, checking temperatures and those kinds of things. Uh, entrances for kids are going to be, are going to be uh, adjusted and, and changed and, and having people at those different stations. Uh, but for visitors, we're going to funnel everybody pretty much through one place and keep those uh, contained into the office area. Um, Multi-use spaces, um, we may have to use things like our auditorium and our commons for larger classes um, or uh, classes that need to spread out. Um, and so those spaces are going to be need to need to be reserved for those types of situations. Um, recess equipment and scheduling is going to is going to have to take place at the building level and what those things are going to look like. Um, 
uh, teachers are encouraged to kind of build in an, in an outdoor, indoor recess movement breaks throughout the day, as opposed to having large groups of students go out and take breaks. Um, as, we, as we look at what breaks look like, it's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, high school, middle school passing periods, are, we're, we're gonna have to limit those as much as we possibly can. Um, our block scheduling helps with that already uh, at the high school level, uh, but we're still looking at ways that we're gonna need to reduce that even, even more. Um, we're gonna have uh, medical supply kits in, in various different areas of the building. Um, as as uh, both Jalinda and Deanna mentioned about uh, pursuing virtual activities when possible as opposed to having those, uh, uh, those activities, but that also refers to meetings um, as we're doing right now. Rather than having this meeting uh, in the auditorium at the high school, uh, we obviously have to do this through Zoom and we're gonna be using those same technologies and that same piece throughout the year, uh, especially at the beginning of the year with our staff meetings, um, site team, uh, site council meetings, all of those things that we're gonna need to use. Um, we'll, be, we'll be using a lot of those kinds of things. Um, again, limiting the non-essential visit, visit, visitors for those of you in elementary that uh, wanna bring treats for your, for your students' birthdays, that's gonna, be, that's gonna have to be uh, put on hold. Um, if we go into a situation where we're on uh, a limited, ex, uh, limited visitor status. Uh, so in advance, we thank you for understanding that that's not something we want to do, uh, but that's just the, the, the necessity of our situation. Um, arrival and dismissal procedures are, uh, are gonna be um, changed and, sh and shifted. This is probably more something for the elementary level and, and middle school level um, is gonna be much more. So please be aware and alert and, and pay attention to, uh, our, to the, to the uh, district Twitter feed and Facebook and, and be on the lookout for emails and things like that, explaining what those things are so that you're aware of those things. Um, altering the bell schedule, I already kind of alluded to that with, uh, to try to reduce hallway um, practices or having large groups of students in the hallways at any one time. Um, having restroom breaks during instructional time, which uh, when we told the teachers that today, I think there, there was a lot of cringing because that, you know, taking away instructional time to have those breaks is, um, is not their, their desire by any stretch of the imagination, but that's something that um, again, something that we don't want to do, but that comes along with this, with this uh, particular situation. Um, I will talk a little bit more about the, about the uh, checkout materials from the librarians. It has been determined that checking out books is, is safe and can be done in a safe manner. So our librarians will be working with ways to continue the checking out materials um, and, and ways to maintain those stable groupings that we've, that we've already referenced and talked about. Um, transitions are also an opportunity for us to uh, limit that cross-contamination, so limiting transitions. Um, this is where we reference those restroom breaks, uh, limiting the number of people and the number of transitions that we have, um, trying to prevent in as much face-to-face -face interaction as we can, which again goes against everything that uh, most of us as, as social human beings uh, thrive on. Um, Talking about classroom doors being uh, propped open so that uh, so that we eliminate those touch points. Um, looking at the same thing for restrooms, um, those restrooms that have doors, having them propped open, or or uh, making sure that those those remain open throughout the day so that um, we we reduce touch points going in and out of restrooms, and uh, minimizing staff travel and and student travel between buildings as much as possible um, to try to again maintain that uh, that that group stability. So uh, th those are some of the common spaces in the transitions pieces. Um, more details will be forthcoming, so please make sure that you're on the lookout for those things and communications from your building administrators, uh, as well as district administration on those pieces. And uh, with that, I'm, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Holthouse, who has, uh, has gonna be talking about uh, extra and co-curricular activities. All right, good evening, and thanks so much for giving your time to help us do this planning and also for your questions and concerns. We appreciate all of that input. Extra and co-curricular activities as well are going to look different. Um, our sports activities are gonna be very dependent on what Keisha and our league choose to do. So decisions will be made through those uh, entities. 
Masks will be worn again by coaches and anyone assisting. And it's going to be uh, all hands on deck to make sure everything is cleaned as well as it can be. Uh, I know Mr. Bang has been having summer workout guy and has some guidelines set up. We'll be following those and going along with those. He's found what works and what doesn't. In the event that we would have a, um, a game or some kind of event scheduled and have to cancel that, it will be out on the district webpage and school messenger will be utilized. We want to try to make this a, a one-stop shop for all parents um, throughout the district. So we will try to make that communication the best we possibly can, realizing that um, many of you have children in different buildings. We're going to uh, limit any kind of team celebration. Uh, there's no more high fives or fist bumps. Uh, and as always, when someone was injured in a game, we made sure the wounds were covered. This is going to have to take that a step further. And if there are any open wounds prior to an event, we would like children to have those or the students to have those covered as well. Um, equipment will be rotated as a possibility to maintain sanitizing protocols. So if there's an opportunity to go outside for a recess or a game, then balls could be used those balls would be limited in number, sanitized, and go back out. Um, we're going to require students provide their own clothing, shoes, bottles, and towels for sporting practices with no sharing. And those are going to be need to be taken home daily. Uh, we're hoping to provide a streaming or recording of any events as, as possible especially at the middle school, high school, uh, at BG Stadium. We know that if we do get to have events, that they may be uh, limited to just an immediate family, or there may be grandparents that are interested in watching their grandchildren, but maybe in that high risk group. So we'd like to be able to live stream or record those events to include those people that may be in that high risk group. Also, we uh, will follow all the safety prevention guidelines when traveling on the bus, as Scott mentioned before. We want stable groups and we wanna encourage athletes to arrive and depart as much as they can and students as well in separate cars. We're gonna, uh, we wanna discourage carpooling and if we are able to take a bus to an event, those away teams maybe have to lim be limited based on our transportation availabilities. As far as the performing arts, we've discussed moving all of the concerts and any theater performances to the spring semester in hopes that the uh, curve will flatten and go down before we get to that spring semester. Uh, practices in large areas are gonna be necessary. For example, band, a very large group at the high school I know, will have to be somehow split into different rooms or spaced out. Uh, marching band performances, again, socially distanced and will have to take place in large areas. We have evidence that singing, when you uh, sing, there's more of a projection. So there are gonna be plans developed for a six to 10 foot uh, distance when singing and develop plans for individual mic use. Cast sizes will have to be based on the size of the stage and the social distancing requirements at that time. Um, again, I mentioned the audiences. We wanna to try to stream and uh, record as many things as we can so that everyone has the opportunity to view those. Thank you, Susie. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so our district nurse, Karen Larkin, was, um, had another commitment this, this evening. So you're gonna get the B team, because um, she is really the health expert. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of walk us through some of the health pieces and um, potentially answer some questions in this area. Because at the end of the day, um, this is what it's all about, is keeping our kids and our staff safe. And so um, this is vitally important. Um, we may ask students, parents, and employees, you know, we're going we're gonna to do the temperature checks. We're going to do the, um, there's a list of common symptoms. We are using that protocol already in our, with our sports uh, workouts. Um, so that's nothing new, especially for those kiddos. Um, we will have signage posted around the buildings reminding the staff of symptoms and students of symptoms and most importantly, how to report those symptoms to the nurse or school personnel so um, we know that information. Uh, defining a close contact. So that is contact with a positive case, someone who has tested positive. Uh, we are within six feet of them for 10 minutes or more. And again, we'll have some signage pieces. A lot of this is training, right, and teaching. So we'll be teaching what those things are so that we kind of have an idea. A lot of that will go for our parents as well so that they kind of know where we are. We will be following the recommended plan from KDHE and KSDE on um, travel quarantines. So if you travel to certain states, we monitor that so that we um, keep an eye on that. So if you, you and your family take a vacation to one of those places, um, we'll be requiring that potential 14-day quarantine when you come back from those states. So we keep an eye on that and we kind of monitor that so we can um, respond to that accordingly. Um, we will be doing temperature and symptom screening. We talked about that. We have the touchless thermometers um, so that every building will have some and they will be, staff will be trained on how to use those. We have currently um, built as much of a stockpile as we can around PPE for our nurses, including gloves, masks, face shields, gowns, um, the thermometers, no touch trash cans. Um, we're working with staff to designate an isolation room in every building in case we have um, somebody who is presenting symptoms, especially if a parent can't get there immediately to pick that child up. We'll make sure that, that um, we isolate them from the rest of the students as much as possible. Um, nurses may be revising medical or medication schedules so that they reduce the number of kids that are in the office, in their offices at one time. Again, close proximity, so we want to continue to space that and practice that social distancing. And then they will obviously be maintaining um, health reports to building administrators. The next slide has a whole lot of stuff on it, um, but this really is the exclusion from school pieces. We will be working with the health department on these, on these particular issues. So right now, if um, the student tests positive or an adult tests positive, um, that test goes to the health department. The health department reaches out to them. Um, the health department helps with the, does the, all the contact tracing. Um, we are able to potentially help in some of that and we're still working out those details with the health department. There are some FERPA guidelines and they have the HIPAA guidelines that we have to kind of follow. So what exactly notification will look like? I can't tell you what that will look like today. Um, but I do know that we'll do our best to keep families informed based on what guidelines they give us and, and what they tell us we can and can't do. So um, that part of the plan hasn't been completely worked out yet, um, but those are the things when somebody asked that question just a few minutes ago. So those are the things that I'm putting on a checklist to make sure we cover and think about. So I appreciate that input. Um, there is the students need to be fever free for 72 hours. There was a push, I believe, within the last 24 hours that we can maybe go back to the 24 hours without um, uh, any type of medication to help with that fever. But as of right now, um, what we've been told is 72 hours fever free without the aid of any, you know, aspirin, Tylenol, those kinds of things. So um, we, if, as that changes, we will let you know. We will communicate with that with you um, and we will make sure that you are in that piece. So basically, all of the wording on that slide boils down to the last slide down there that says, we'll follow the health department guidelines for anyone who tests positive for COVID, whether that be students or staff. Um, we'll follow their direction and we'll do what they ask us to do. Um, we may ask for, if, if you are, if a child is quarantined or a staff member is quarantined um, and test positive, we may ask for the um, release to return 
from the health department. And those are common standard practices. So um, those are things we've already kind of had in place. We'll just continue to monitor this and adjust as we need to. Okay, now it's the time for the questions that everybody has kind of wanted to know all about masks. So before I dive into that, what I wanna say is masks are a very, um, and have been a very polarizing piece. And for us, um, my goal is to keep us in that middle of the road with respect and care and focused on the health and safety of all of our staff and students. So the mask guidelines um, currently, recently, yesterday at about four o'clock changed. So what we have written here is what we wrote yesterday prior to the governor's executive order 2058. And 2058 outlines mask usage. Um, so you'll see at the top, this is all draft. We recognize it may change based on current or future um, state or local guidelines. So at this point in time, staff and visitors will need to wear masks and students pre-K through 12th grade will need to wear masks. In the executive order, and again, we didn't have that information when we created this slide deck, um, there are some exceptions in that um, and we are aware of that. And as we move forward, we will monitor and adjust to what that says. But as of right now, what's in the executive order is wearing masks. Um, oh, I guess it's 2059, I'm sorry. It's 2059, 2058 is about the delaying of school. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 2059 also talks about social distancing, temperature checks. It does say that, and I will just read it directly, um, the social distancing guideline does, the requirement does not apply to in-person instruction in classrooms when masks or other face coverings are worn. So um, as long as we, and then it goes on to define masks and all of those, those pieces. Um, we are going to provide masks for staff and students. You're gonna have the ability to choose to bring your own mask if you want to. Um, it will need building administration approval to make sure the mask meets the district safety and dress protocols. So um, is it the two-ply mask? Is it, is it you know, a cloth mask? Is it pantyhose? I'm just kidding, it wouldn't be that. Um, but all of those things that it meets our dress protocols, dress code protocols. Um, so those pieces will be put in place. Um, and then we will make exceptions based on what's in the guidance and um, we'll, we'll work on those details as we have more of that kind of finalized. Like I said, it changed yesterday um, in the midst of, as we were kind of finishing up our day, um, that's when the new guidance came out. So we have not adjusted this yet. Um, Again, if you, we have people on both ends of the continuum. We have people who do not want to send their kids if we don't have masks. We have people who do not want to send their kids if we do wear masks. Our goal is to provide everybody choices, whether it be in-person, hybrid, remote, so that whatever that choice is you need to make as a parent, um, we have those opportunities available for you and your student and that we support that. That is our goal um, and we will continue to do our very best to make that happen. You'll see some other hygiene measures down there at the bottom, um, washing hands or sanitizing when they come in and out of classrooms. That's a pretty standard procedure. You'll see that in hospitals, in hospital rooms, you sanitize in, you sanitize out. Um, our sports kids have been doing that all summer long as they've been working. We will have hand sanitizing or hygiene stations. Um, we're gonna ask them you know, to sanitize their belongings frequently, obviously cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue or your elbow. And then again, as I think Susan said, no high fives, hugs, handshakes, which I know with, with pre-K kiddos, not getting a hug is gonna be tough. And so I'm sure we'll sneak one in every now and then, hopefully. But um, that is the health section. Um, but before we go on to that, let's talk a little bit about um, EO, the Executive Order 2058. That is the current order that the governor put out to um, move the start of school back to September 9th. We had already been talking um, as a district and with the board a little bit about what could that look like. Um, if we hadn't thought all the way to September 9th, I will tell you there are some metro um, districts in Wichita that are thinking about moving it back to the 9th um, with or without the governor's orders. That was kind of already in their plans. We had not thought maybe that far in advance, but until that goes through, the school board, the state school board tomorrow, um, 
we don't really know where that's going to land yet. So um, we're watching that very closely. The state board meets tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and then we will, excuse me, we should know more after that um, about kind of where that executive order is heading. Executive order 2059 is not under the guidance of the state board. So that one is, is different. So the, the face mask, social distancing, that executive order is different than 2058, which is talking about moving the start of school back to the September 9th date. All right, before we dive into the very end, do we have any um, questions, Kathy? Um, I think there's, there is confusion around still, how are you gonna start school and how do these three plans work uh, uh, together? Because th I think there's some confusion about how you're going to weave these three. Do you start out at school and then move to these? Can you start out at the hybrid? So if you could explain that, I think that would clear up some confusion. It'll be as clear as mud when we're done. Okay, so yes, we are planning on starting as a district in person. That is our goal. If the health department would tell us that um, the numbers are high in the county and we need to move into hybrid or all the way to remote to reduce the number of kids in the building, then we would adjust to that um, kind of as we go. Somebody uh, tailored it or, or kind of equated it to, um, it's like a snow day. We, we'd say, okay, the numbers are too high. We need to have a snow day, except it's like a COVID day. Um, and we might move into remote. We might have a building that um, becomes a cluster and the health department might ask us to put that building into remote learning for 14 days and quarantine the building. Um, I don't know that that's what's gonna happen. We're just prepared to move any direction based on kind of whatever happens and the events that happen. Our goal is always gonna be in-person instruction. With that in mind, that's what the district is, and the buildings are doing as a whole. If as a parent, I choose to put my, to have my child do remote learning and we're gonna get access to that content and curriculum and teachers and the assessments and that's gonna look a little very different than it did with continuous learning, I can make that choice. Now, exactly how do I make that choice today? I can't tell you that. But as a parent, I could say, I want my child at Blackmore Elementary and I wanna do remote learning. So they'll be enrolled at Blackmore Elementary but the teacher you're assigned to may be different than the second grade teacher that you're, if my child's in second grade, it might not be a second grade teacher. I might be assigned to a third grade teacher who's checking in on my second grader, but I'm still getting second grade content. Um, that doesn't really change. So as a parent, I have complete choice on kind of how I want that to look for my child and my family. As a district, we're also running our in-person learning and then we are ready to move into remote or hybrid if that's a direction we are given. But our goal is always to stay in that in-person as much as we can. And that, unfortunately, if we would move into that, I have no way to know when and if that's coming other than trying to monitor the numbers. And I will tell you right now, they've not given us a set number that this is the line that puts us into remote or this is the line that puts us into hybrid. Does that answer some of it? And Tracy, um, oh, individuals had asked about um, Keisha and if they choose the hybrid, how does that work? I don't think we know the answer to that yet because I don't think Keisha has told us that, but I wrote it down and it is one of the things we will find out. So part of what we'll do after um, taking the questions that are in the bit.ly and some of the questions that have been online tonight that Kathy's been capturing, we will take those and make a Q&A page for us frequently asked questions so that um, you get those answers. We may not be able to answer them all tonight because that will probably take some input from Keisha. So oh. uh, it's coming up again. Can they start in the hybrid from day one? Yep. We'll figure out how to make that work. Yes. Okay. Um, who in the health department is making the calls? I don't know that it's one particular person. I believe they have a team, um, but I will. I wrote that question down to ask that question. I don't think it's one. I've talked to multiple people at the health department, so I don't know that it's one individual who's making all those, that makes the final decision. Um, Jamie Downs, I believe, is the, the runs the department, but I don't know that she makes every decision, but I'll find out for sure. 
Um, are we going to be testing at school, COVID-19 testing, the swab, taking the tests at school? Um, I hope not. I do not plan on that, no. I don't think that's our, I don't think we have the, um, we probably have the medical expertise, but I don't think that's our role. And the, the, the protocols and best practice when like teachers are sick or students are sick, what are you thinking? Are, are those no. to, to be determined at a later date? Well, some of the, okay, so some of the decisions of, it gets very, um, I'm going to use the word convoluted because that's the word that pops to mind. So I, there's a difference between I've tested positive and I've been exposed to someone who's tested positive or um, I've been exposed to someone who was exposed and that's sort of what it becomes, right? It becomes this domino piece. And so there's a lot of decisions that have to go into who quarantines, who self quarantines, how long do they do that? Um, and really those are some of the decisions we'll be leaving up to the health department to help us drive some of that. Um, we've talked a little bit about contact tracing. We're gonna do our best to maintain stable groups, to know where kids are sitting so that, and who they've interacted with so that we can help with some of that. Um, but again, there may be some FERPA guidelines and some guidance we haven't gotten yet from KASB, the Kansas Association of School Boards, on any, if, if any at all, of that information that we can share. So um, we're going to ask the health department to do some training with our teams so that we understand how it works better. Um, but a lot of that will be left up to the health department to do because that really is their area of expertise, not ours. I want us and our teachers focused on teaching and learning and keeping our kids safe. Um, we're going to have to take some guidance from the health department on how do we move through all these different levels. Can you bring up the slide that has the start times, please? Yes, I can. Let me see if I can remember which one roughly that is. It would be, look at that. There we go, right there. Got um, in, in this, if they choose to start out with hybrid and they choose to come and be in school, is that change? Are they able to do that, make those changes within the school year? Or do they have to wait to the next school year? Um, wow, we hadn't talked about that one. I will tell you that our focus from the get-go has been how to best support and how to be flexible and fluid. So do I know today what that looks like? Probably not. Do I know that we have people who can make that happen? Sure. So if you start in remote and you say, you know, the cases have gone down, um, I'm comfortable sending my child to school now and I want to send them to in-person, we can do that. We'll, we can figure out how to make that work. I don't have a problem with that. Is the district planning on having a pre-K program this year, AM, PM? Yes, we are. And are those times, have they been, have they been um, yet gone before the board? No, this will go for the, um, in front of the board and really, um, our goal is not to make this time shift a permanent piece. Um, our goal is really, this was the best we could do to space kids out on the bus and give us the ability to sanitize in between groups. Um, that was really where the time shift came from. Um, it, it allows us to do both of those things and still get kids to school on time. Um, but our goal will be to move back to the time frame that we had before. I think there's still a lot of questions regarding, you know, going from on in school to hybrid to remote, and we probably could post those in our FAQs, yeah. correct? Because honestly, um, those are the things that once we get our plan kind of in place, then we can start having those conversations um, about all of those details. So once we get the plan in place and um, the board has approved all of the pieces that we're proposing, because again, keep in mind, this is a team of about 45 people who have proposed these pieces. Um, we've gotten input on the surveys. We've gotten input from classroom teachers and staff today, this afternoon. We're getting input from our parents and community this evening. And then tomorrow that team will come back together, looking at that feedback, looking at that information um, to talk about, okay, so what do we need to tweak? Is there something else we need to talk about? Oh, we hadn't thought of that. Um, that will be the final touches we'll put on tomorrow, and then it will go to the board for their approval. Once we have that piece, and we know this is our start time, and this is our date we're going to start school, and we may need to shift our calendar, 
Um, if we do move the dates back a little bit, what does that start to look like? Um, because we're still required to have kids in school 1,116 hours this year. So those things don't change. Um, then we can start putting the, the meat on the bones, if you will. We'll have the framework, we'll know kind of where we're going, and then it will be those things of, okay, how do I enroll my student in remote? How do I talk to my building administrator about um, hybrid in, in this particular building? And so that's some of those decisions that'll still need to be um, made as we kind of move forward. So those are, those are great questions because it gives us things to think about between now and then. We had a question about what the, what are teachers most concerned with? Um, interestingly enough, it was the same for teachers and for parents. The top concerns in the survey were the health and physical safety of themselves, or if I was a parent of my child, um, mask wearing, and again, that was on both sides of that continuum. You have people who, are, who want masks and you have people who don't want masks. I will tell you, um, you can be one of the first ones to see, um, these are the masks. I can't, can't see myself, so I don't know if you can see it. Um, but they say, oh, oh, you can't see it. USD 490, hashtag part of the pride. Some of them will be plain black. Again, those are the ones we're gonna provide um, because that way we have them if you need them. and um, then we'll also have the ability to, you'll have the ability to, to send your own if that's what you want to do and it meets the health and the dress code policies. Um, start times, are we still planning August 12th or September 9th or? So right now the executive order before the State Board of Education is starting on August, or sorry, September 9th that there would not be any instruction, sports activities between August 10th, there's a list of them, sports activities, performances, um, attendance, instruction, athletic practice, competition, rehearsal performance, or other interaction of an instructional manner, virtual or online, cannot start until um, after August, between August 10th and August 9th, none of that can happen. I'm sorry, August 10th and September 9th, none of that can happen. Um, there are some ca some pieces about, um, you know, if having to do with dual credit classes and, and concurrent enrollment and those kinds of things. So there are some um, caveats, but for the most part, it's no instruction between August 10th and September 9th. That has to go to the state board, um, and then that has to continue to move forward. So as of right now, tonight at 7 o'clock, our start time would be, our start date would be in September. Um, that could change. So we'll, we'll give you more information and hopefully we'll know that answer um, after the board sees our proposal. So the board has to make that decision or has to approve the plan and that will be yep. on the website and school messenger and um, parents want to know what if they're, what if they refuse to have their child wear a mask? Um, I don't have an answer for that right now um, because that would be once it is um, once the executive order is in place, um, we'll have to talk to our uh, KSB attorneys about what that looks like and how that works. Um, if you don't want them to wear a mask and that is a requirement, then one of the options would be remote learning. That could be a potential possibility. So we can we'll have to we'll have to talk about those things because I don't think I have all those answers. Will there be another Zoom for concerns after the plan has been finalized? Um, I don't mind input, so we could we can continue to talk about kind of where we're at and what we're doing. I don't have a problem with that. It might have to be in smaller groups though, because the Zoom with bigger groups is a little pricey. We'll just do smaller groups. Um, Any, any information that you can give for training for substitutes? Are we going to be doing, you know, our substitutes will be trained as much as, um, you know, will they get this same training? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about training for substitutes. Yeah, we could, we could uh, do some things for them. Yeah, we can talk about that. That's a good idea. And I just think there's some confusion um, the, how who's going to decide the start times of school and the date and when that information will be coming out. Okay, so 
There's currently on the start date an executive order from the governor. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, that will go to the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education will either um, confirm or, I believe, it, uh, confirm or deny, basically, say yes, say no, if whether or not they support that executive order. Um, I will tell you we are in uncharted territories because there is some, um, that piece has not been how the executive orders were given in the past. That was a new, new piece of the puzzle after the last legislative session. So there is question then if, if it's not approved, does it then go back to the governor? What are those next steps? So um, until tomorrow at 10 o'clock when the state board comes together, as of right now, the governor's order is for schools to start September 9th. Um, that could change tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Now, with that in mind, the school board, the local school board determines the calendar and the start and stop times for schools. So that information will um, be part of the proposal that we put in front of our board. Um, the, the pieces that our group has talked about, the group of about 45 that they have talked about, again, for the, the start and stop times for schools, that really is so we can clean and sanitize the buses so that kids are um, at less risk. That's a precautionary piece for our kids um, and our staff. That's part of that piece. The piece about starting school, um, could we move it back a little bit so we had some additional time with staff so we could do training? Um, keep in mind, they have not done hybrid and remote ever um, in the new format in the way we'd be doing it. So that's gonna take some professional learning on their part to deliver high quality instruction. So, um, and we want that to happen. So could we, could the team recommend maybe moving it back a day, a week? That could happen. Um, and so that would be part of the final proposal that we put forward. So there's a, there's a lot at play in here and that is probably the hardest thing is to keep track of what's the current game plan out there because we have to respond to kind of all those moving parts and pieces. That's the hardest part of this, to be honest. So with that, the board will be, our local board will be deciding, we'll be approving the plan and part of that plan will be a calendar of either lengthening the school year or hours or minutes in a day, correct? To get that 1116. Depending on what happens tomorrow, yes. But we will get our 1116, that's the key part of this. We have to have kids in school, in learning, 1116 hours. Remote learning counts as in school learning for 1116 1, hours. So yes, all of those pieces count. Hybrid, remote, counts. And we will have a FAQ section. Um, we will try to collect all this information. So I think a lot of these other questions can be answered in those without repeating some information. Awesome. And that is really our whole intent tonight was to get everybody together because we truly believe that um, by the time we take this to the board, we will have had input from about um, probably, we are 1140, 12, 13, 1400 people um, to help design what it is we're doing as a district. Um, there's our reopening team. They are working and I wanna take a minute to thank them because they are going above and beyond. Um, the guidance document from the State Department was one, about 1100 pages long. Um, and these folks have kind of dived into it and tried to decide what that kind of looks like in our district, and I appreciate that. Um, again, please go to the questions, comments, and kudos. Um, you know, it, it's nice to, to hear that um, they would like to hear a thank you for all the time they're putting in. It's been an effort of love, I will say that, um, but there's a lot to kind of wrap our heads around because it is different than we've ever really experienced before. I appreciate them. I appreciate the time they're putting in. I appreciate all you being here tonight because it does help us think of things that we didn't think of. Um, and that's important. You know, we're in this kind of together. And so um, helping each other kind of think that through is, is good stuff. So input, I believe, is important. So please, please, please share your ideas and thoughts. All right. We thank you. Thank you for jumping on Zoom with us tonight. And we will see you soon. All right, take care everybody.